Okay, hi. Um, I'll switch gears a little bit and let's switch this first. Hope that works. Yeah, I shouldn't hide in the corner, I guess. Okay, I'm going to talk about Gaia buffer motions and the satellite system of our, <coughs> of our Milky Way. And you've probably heard about this uh, already, but just in case uh, you're really focused on high redshift. The redshift range I'm working on is negative 0.01 <laughs> to that. So it's really nearby star. And um, much of my work is motivated by looking at so-called planes of satellite galaxies. So quick recap of uh, what we know there right now, because I just wrote this nice review earlier this year. So we have a highly flattened distribution of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. And there, before Gaia, there were indications that this is rotating. So color-coded here is uh, a view. If you would sit outside of the Milky Way, stuff down here is approaching, stuff up here is receding. So it's color-coded by line of sight velocity. It looks like it's a rotating plane. Similar system was found around Andromeda. So this is uh, the Andromeda galaxy in the center. These are the satellite galaxies with independent footprint, and about half of them are part of a highly flattened distribution, which seems to be rotating again. So if you see it, we see it edge on, and we see that there's a clear coherent line of sight velocity trend. And then earlier this year, we published this um, about the Centaurus A satellite system, and it looks like it's also it was known before that this is flattened, and we looked at the velocities of uh, satellites in there, and out of 16, 14 show coherent velocity trend, which is again consistent with the rotating plane of satellite galaxies. And we were super lucky that this is a beautiful host galaxy, so science put us on the cover. Um, we didn't really have much to do with that otherwise. Um, anyway, uh, this is basically just a plug. Uh, if you're interested in more, have a look at my review article earlier this year. Uh, maybe to further motivate that. Um, this is a real issue for Lambda CDM. Um, you don't find systems as extreme as in those three cases frequently in simulations. So what's plotted here is uh, on the x-axis we have a measure of the flattening of satellite planes for the Milky Way, Andromeda and Centaurus A case. On the vertical axis we have a measure for the kinematic coherence. And to be similar to the observed, <laughs> to be similar to the observed cases, um, you would have to be in one of those corners up there. This is very rare, about one in a thousand for each case. Okay, so we will now focus on the Milky Way system and look at the orbital poles of satellite galaxies. Orbital poles are the directions of angular momentum. So if you have a Milky Way here, you have a satellite orbiting around it, this direction is the orbital pole, the direction of angular momentum, and that's what's plotted in those green points down here in an all-sky plot. So the Milky Way plane is here. If an orbital pole is along the Milky Way equator, that means the satellite is on a polar orbit. If it would be down here, it would be co-orbiting with the plane of the Milky Way. And this is the situation uh, 12 years ago. Um, these symbols here give us um, the directions of normal vectors of planes fitted to the satellite distribution. So if you, if you want to say that satellites are orbiting in a plane, the normal vector to the plane should also be the same direction as the orbital poles. And 12 years ago, this looked kind of promising, but there were large uncertainties and a lot of scatter. So this circle here denotes the um, kind of clustering around this direction. And as we then went on and got better and better for promotions, mostly from HST measurements, there are more, and the clustering became tighter and tighter the last year. And then now I'm adding Gaia proper motions. So this is a combination of HST and Gaia for the more distant satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. HST is still the best game in town. And we can see that there's a really tight clustering. Out of the 11 classical satellite galaxies, eight orbit in the plane. So seven in this. So seven of them orbit in the same direction. And there's sculpture over here, which is 180 degrees off. It's orbiting in the same plane, but in the opposite direction. Gaia really helped to uh, especially show us that uh, Joanna is also part of this coherent movement trend. This is only the classical satellite galaxies. Um, just after the data release too, we uh, got really busy working um, in the, well, ironically, the HST proper motion collaboration. Uh, 
jump at Gaia data, and we, uh, within six days, we put out this paper looking at the proper motions of um, almost 40 satellite galaxies around the Milky Way, looking at um, the proper motions of spectroscopically constructed member stars. And we also put in uh, a number of interpretations already. So um, one of the plots there is, this is the distance from the Milky Way, this is the total velocity of satellite galaxies, and you can see that well, these are all the measurements. The further out you go, the less certain our measurements are. Um, but it looks like these proper motions, these total velocities, are more consistent with the heavy Milky Way. So this is the escape velocity for a Milky Way of um, 1.6 times 10 to the 12, in contrast to a, a light Milky Way down here. So it looks like we have a relatively heavy Milky Way halo. Another early result was, um, if you look at um, orbits in a light and a heavy Milky Way, you can look at the distribution of um, the, um, the phase along the orbit satellites you're looking at. You expect that the satellite spends most time at apocenter center because that's where they are slowest, whereas they really zip through if they are down here at Cary center. What we see, especially in the light Milky Way case, but also in the heavy Milky Way case, on the left here, that's satellite close to Cary center, this is close to apocenter. center. Most of uh, majority of satellite galaxies are closer to the Cary center than to the apocenter. center. It kind of means that we see the nearby stuff, but there should be satellite galaxies out there at April Center, which we probably haven't discovered yet. So this is a kind of a kinematic hint at um, missing satellite galaxies around the Milky Way, which are yet to be discovered. Um, we also look at Crater 2, which uh, is a very, very diffuse satellite galaxy around the Milky Way, which has an extremely low velocity dispersion. And it was suggested that it might be formed by stripping its dark matter halo. That would require it to have a very close passage to the Milky Way, so a very small pericenter. What we find is an orbit plot, time and uh, distance from the Milky Way. We get, especially for the heavy Milky Way potential, we get pericenters of down to 20 kiloparsecs. That kind of goes into the right direction. It still seems to be a bit too far away to completely solve the issue. Um, but this is promising and uh, getting us in a scenario to explain the morphology and the kinematics, the internal kinematics of Crater 2. Um, we also looked at uh, this proposed Crater Leo group. So it was proposed that, well, we see in simulation that some satellite galaxies fall in together as groups. And these satellites, or the Milky Way, are all aligned along one line, have a very coherent distance gradient. So the idea was maybe this is a group infall or remnant of a group infall. Unfortunately, these uh, the systems are up to 200 kiloparsecs away, and our proper motions are not precise enough to really pinpoint their direction of motion. So you see these gigantic uncertainties here. Year two seems to be moving along the preferred direction, crater two, but all the other ones have basically unconstrained optical motion. Okay, let's go back to the vast polar structure. So I showed you the 11 classical satellites before. This is what it looks like for all the satellite galaxies for which we have proper motions. So my prediction was always that uh, orbital fold should be somewhere in this circle. Now, it definitely looks like there's, a, there's an overdensity, but it also looks pretty messy. This is including all satellite galaxies, including those which have um, orbital pole uncertainties of up to 200 degrees. They could have all kinds of orbits. So if you do some quality cuts, um, we see that if we cut it down, say, to uncertainties of 10 degrees only. There's a clear over density of orbital poles right where I would expect them. There are a few objects which don't seem to be part of this vast polar structure of the satellite plane around the Milky Way. But there's definitely uh, a clear association of um, many of them with where I would have expected them. So this um, motivated me to look at it in the context of the whole local group again. So we have Andromeda down here, we have the Milky Way up here, and all the satellite galaxies. And that's the orientation of the satellite galaxy planes. So they, they have rather similar orientations. This is polar to the Milky Way, this is kind of also north-south direction. And interestingly, they are rotating in the same, same sense internally. But what's maybe more interesting, which I didn't put enough emphasis on in the past, I would say, is if you look at all the non-satellite galaxies in the local group, the stuff around that, 
you see really big empty patches and you can describe the distribution for two planes too. So in particular, these yellow highlighted galaxies seem to form kind of a band going from the top above the Milky Way down here, bridging over to Andromeda. And let's see what that might mean. So if we put ourselves in the center of the local group and look at an all sky distribution of dwarf galaxies, you see these two satellite galaxies, non satellite galaxy planes here and here. So let's focus on this, what I call local group plane one, which starts kind of over here where the great plane of Andromeda ends. So this is a satellite plane of Andromeda. This is a satellite plane of the Milky Way seen at about 30 degrees angle. And then we have these galaxies here. And then in the north of the Milky Way, we have uh, kind of a continuation of that. We can look at the relative orientations of all things. Um, this is again an all-sky plot, but again showing the directions of angular momentum. So this is the average direction of angular momentum of the satellite plane around the Milky Way, the spin. This is the one for Andromeda. They have progressed. This is kind of this local group plane, the satellite plane, the non-satellite plane between the two. Again, similar orientation. Interestingly, this is very close to the supergalactic plane, so there might be some connection to large-scale structure. Uh, Andromeda spin, and this is the direction to Andromeda. It's important because the relative motion between the Milky Way and Andromeda has to be 90 degrees of that, and there's an HSD for the motion for Andromeda and a Gaia for the motion now, which puts it here with those uncertainties. So all that is consistent with all those structures, all those orbits, having very similarly oriented angular momentum. So there seems to be a connection over the whole local group tying those structures together. It kind of gets better. So this is a schematic view. Andromeda, satellite plane on the one Andromeda orbits in this sense, is seen phase on. Satellite plane on the Milky Way in this sense. We kind of have this bridge of dwarf galaxies and the major stream falling into the Milky Way. At the same time, you have uh, galaxies on the opposite side, which um, all these seem to be in a common, very narrow plane. And most of those are also identified as backsplash galaxies, so galaxies which have been closed by but flown out again. They kind of tend to recede at larger velocities than the Hubble flow. They must have been nearby before. That suggests that everything is kind of moving in that way, uh, which uh, I just reread this paper of myself, and that's kind of what I uh, noted down here. So this NGC 3109 association, it's five galaxies moving away from us, basically uh, has a, a very linear shape. It's basically a pencil moving away from us. All with the same speed. Um, as well as the other structures in the local group, looks like that there's something coming in from Andromeda moving out on the other side. And those galaxies actually recede faster than you expect in land VCGM simulations of the, the Elvis kind, where you can look at how fast the stuff moving away from the Mikuei um, Andromeda analog. So we can go back to Gaia data and look at Milky Way satellite galaxies, do they have a preferred direction of motion relative to the Milky Way, now that we have 3D velocity vectors? This is an all-sky plot, now not plotting orbital poles, but the direction of, a, of the motion of a satellite galaxy. Imagine they are all put in the center of the Milky Way, they just continue to move in that direction. That's where they would be going. So it looks awfully empty down here. This is the average direction of motion. It's kind of, it doesn't make way north. They are kind of coming from this direction, preferentially moving in that direction. This dotted line splits the hemispheres. So there are about um, three out of four satellite galaxies in this half of the sky, moving in that direction, I mean, than in this direction. This is direction to Andromeda. So it really looks like stuff is coming from Andromeda. This is this association I was talking about possible black backsplash galaxies on the opposite side. So there might actually be some signature of this preferred motion along the local group in our own halo, which might indicate that not all of those satellite galaxies are necessarily bound to the Milky Way. If it's really stuff moving through, then we might make substantial mistakes in estimating the mass of the Milky Way halo by forcing them to be bound. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Reminder, and with that I'm kind of done. Um, 
This is, of course, somewhat speculative, but what might be useful for you is you have proper motions and you can play around with them. Um, some of them still have substantial uncertainties, of course, but we already see trends. So we see that there's a preference to indeed orbit along the vast polar structure, not just for the classical satellite galaxies, but also for those satellite galaxies for which we have relatively well constrained orbital poles. Um, I think this kind of shows that the satellite galaxy problem remains uh, very important and kind of weird, uh, especially because it, there, there might be some connection to the larger scale distribution of dwarf galaxies in the local group, which kind of hopefully gives us a hint to, to solving this issue. So we can talk about ideas how to do that later. Uh, for now, I just want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, asking questions. <laughs>
yeah, we, we kind of have to uh, mask out those regions because we don't know anything about it. So whenever we do comparisons, statistical comparisons, we have to match that. Um, yeah, it would be great to look outside, but we can't really. <laughs>